Hi, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for August 4th, 2015. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Today, I'm joined by Jim Clausing Online. Jim, how are you doing today? Good, glad to be back. Fantastic. Also joined on the couch today by Stan Nurilov, frequent contributor. How are you doing, Stan? Oh, pretty well, thank you, Matt. Great, and Joe Harton. Hey, Matt, doing well. <laughs> Great. All right. I was about to ask. I, I jumped the gun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm Matt Kaiser. Uh, let's jump right into our first story. Uh, this is just sort of an update on last week. The bind bug that was out last week, the CVE 2015-5477, has been seen in the wild. So if you haven't been paying attention, that's the bind bug that a single UDP packet with a, a T key crafted request can crash the server. So if you're running bind and you haven't patched, now would definitely be a good time to do so. If you you don't have the option of patching, you can at least kind of keep an eye on your logs and see if these T-key requests are coming in. Uh, but at that point, it might be a little bit too late. Uh, I know we also have a, a quick update from Jim on a WordPress vulnerability that's just been released. Care to talk about it, Jim? This just came out, I guess this morning, um, that um, there's an update to WordPress. 4.2.4 has been released. We've talked about the other WordPress issues in the past and this one the uh, folks at wordpress.org are strongly encouraging you to update your sites immediately uh, there are six security issues uh, addressed in this one three cross-site scripting potential sql injection a couple other things so if you manage WordPress sites and you didn't get this update applied automatically, which several of my sites did get it applied automatically today, um, you need to go ahead and apply this one pretty quick. Uh, when when they tell you to update your site immediately, they you, you can expect that the exploits will be seen in the wild pretty soon. So, yeah, so it's a... Another WordPress update, and so if you uh, manage WordPress sites, apply the update. All right. Thanks a lot, Jim. Moving on to our next story, Stan, you were going to talk a little bit about the Thunderstrike attacks, which are coming out uh, at Black Hat this week, which sounds fascinating. Yeah, it's actually a pretty interesting story. <laughs> well, we always say that PCs are more vulnerable. Oh, well, actually, we never say that. <laughs> People always assume that Macs are more secure somehow. Uh, and one class of malware or one class of vulnerability that impacts the firmware on the various parts of the PC also can impact the Mac. So these researchers have basically discovered a way uh, to worm some of these firmware exploits so that you can take a simple device that's for like a Mac and then use that as a spreading mechanism. So let me take it a step back and get into the details. Is that taking a step back? <laughs> I think it's, you can both, both ways. Um, so... Basically, these vulnerabilities, you know, have been well studied in uh, PC firmware. And just now, these researchers are saying, well, hold on, Macs are also vulnerable, right? So what they did is they created this proof of concept code that takes the vulnerability and really showcases how it can be used. They actually have an interesting YouTube video that I suggest everybody watch just to be, uh, the, sho uh, the shock factor is amazing. So you can have a simple web exploit that infects a machine. Um, and if you have a, a, one of these Thunderbolt adapters, uh, that are plugged in, for example, like a Gigan uh, Ethernet adapter or like one of the VGA adapters that they have for the Macs. If that device has option ROM, which is, I guess, a feature that a device can have, it, uh, the worm will detect that, and then it will write itself to the firmware of that, of that dongle, basically. And whenever you plug that into another Mac, there's a way you can trigger the vulnerability again, and then it will just copy itself to the firmware of the Mac. So you can go walk around with this dongle and just plug it into all of these uh, Macs and just have the virus there. And the problem with these firmware viruses, just like in the PC world, is that they live so low in the system. No AV checks for them. Mm -hmm. you know, there's no real protections against it. And once you're that low level in the system, you can really be just writing your malware all the time to disk. So you can really persist. And reimaging your hard drive isn't going to help because the, the malware that lives in the firmware She's going to always be detecting that's you know if it's present or not, and then just putting itself back on there. You can change the hard drive, you can reimage it. It's not going to help. You really have to uh, kind of like reflash the BIOS almost, and doing that is not, I guess, a simple feat. Uh, so would it 
would it be on the charger cable? So I'm thinking of, I was in the airport last week, if, if say a charger cable at one of those public charging stations got hmm. this malware, would that infect anybody who charged at that? I guess if it had this option ROM uh, okay. capability, uh, then potentially, yeah, there's that's a kind of a that. scary thought, right? That is very scary. And actually, that was, I think, on an episode of CSI Cyber, wasn't it? it? Uh -huh. I think it was, yeah. So it was possible there, and it sounds like something like in a movie, and yeah. I think this kind of exploit actually makes it possible. Well, I think the attack is, is as I understand it, primarily against Mac devices, yes. Mac laptops, PCs. I don't know why you'd be using a charging cable and I think in a, an airport, you'd only be, you know what I mean? You, you typically yeah, charge you know. a mobile device in that situation. Right, right. You're right. But it's, it's not impossible that someone, and I think during the demo video, they actually use um, a modified, um, it looks like an Ethernet to a Thunderbolt connector. Yeah, And, and they're using so. that chip inside of there. So any, any peripherals, like if you show up, I think it was kind of funny, I was looking at Trammell Hudson's Twitter. Trammell Hudson, uh, Zeno Cove, and Corey Kallenberg are the people behind the research. Yeah. And Trammell Hudson's Twitter has a, a, I think it's a bit of a joke, saying, if anybody wants to use any, you know, anyone needs any Thunderbolt dongles while we're at Black Hat, yeah. just see me. And everyone's <laughs> like, Haha, not doing that. Yeah. No, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty cool research. I think the video shows that they're chaining a couple exploits um, looked like one of the ones, there was one recently where if you, you know, put your laptop to sleep and open it back up, certain protection bits yeah. are no longer in place. I think that's part of the, the, the demo that they're doing. So there's a lot of really cool stuff in there. Right. And like I said, I would recommend anybody look at that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I picked up though on this is they seem to, in the article, kind of be almost obsessed with the fact that saying Macs are also uh, vulnerable. But I mean, there's also the sort of the likelihood to be exploited, right? So it's sure. not just what's vulnerable, but what is actually going to be exploited. You, you know, if it takes a researcher who's getting a salary to write something to exploit a Mac uh, based on vulnerability, but if you're on a PC and there's however many hackers actually trying to get into a PC versus the smaller community that's trying to hack Macs, I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's a factor that you really need to understand that maybe it is true that Macs are more secure not necessarily because of the you know the infrastructure the software but just because of the demand to get on that machine that's you know? a fair point but at the same time i guess these days there's a lot of nation state sponsored adversaries who right. are doing similar type of research and usually they don't talk about these findings of black hat i would imagine right so but that I mean, research there's still is a important. community of people who just don't like pc users or don't like pcs or find that sure. there's more people on pcs it's easier to get to more users mm -hmm. by having a pc exploit sure so. there's for the people who are, who are hacking for profit there's definitely like a risk reward yeah. do i spend all the time on the mac platform or do i go where the users are right exactly. I, I think i know what you mean and macs are i think gaining more popularity but there's also the I think from a security practitioner side, people are a little bit tired of saying, well, I use a Mac, right? so I don't have to worry about any of that I stuff. And yeah. this is sort of maybe sticking it to those people who say that, but it's also some very interesting and in-depth research. It's not yeah. just something you you know flippantly say, well, <laughs> I found something for the Mac. It's, I spent half a year and now I've definitely got something to be worried about. Right. right. But it's like, do you have the same security system on a bank in New York City that you would have in you know the middle of nowhere in Iowa. If there's a lot more demand in the more populated area, then maybe the security system you need, where there's less people looking to get in, isn't the same. Sure. So I, I can see that. I, w I would I would counter that by saying that on the internet there's no such thing as location, and it doesn't much matter if someone's scanning you know Big Bank USA in New York City or Podunk right. you know. Savings yeah, and you could say the contents are just as valuable either way. Yep. So, but. all right. Cool. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, and I think just uh, pay attention after the Black Hat talk. They think they'll be releasing some scripts, uh, so all the researchers can see how this attack works, or maybe how to scan for it, or how to detect it. So. And hopefully a, a patch will be forthcoming as well, uh, hopefully. Right. I guess there's so many different uh, issues uh, that are part of this mm -hmm. that will probably be multiple patches, some mm -hmm. of them possible and probably some of them. So they'll uh, patch it before change. they find an exploit? The ones that have been found can be patched and hopefully they'll be able to more attention paid right, to. But there isn't an exploit yet, it's just the, the research, right? Well, they, they've, the video they showed is a soup to nuts exploit of, of oh, installing right. a malicious firmware on a Mac. But it's not in the wild yet. As far as we know. Yeah. Yep. We'll okay. hope not. We yeah. Hope not. That's the danger, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. thanks, Dan.
Joe, heading over to you, looks like you've got a story about some interesting security features Google is hoping to implement. Yeah, so Google put out a blog post recently and a bunch of the you know, tech news sites picked up stories on it that they're going to allow bring your own key encryption on their cloud infrastructure, uh, the Google Compute Engine. It's still in beta in the U.S. and a handful of other countries, but basically they're, they're saying Google's not going to retain any of your application data because you're going to provide your own key. They'll only hold the key while it's transient. So you know, they're, they're sort of touting this as no one here has your data. If we get someone gets into our side of things, they're not going to be able to access your data, which is interesting. You know, this isn't the only cloud that offers this, but Google's is being a lot more sort of raw about it. They're, they're not just offering, some of the other clouds offer just a, a key management system, or they don't let you bring your own encryption all the way down to the compute node engine, so the, you know, like the VM level. Some of the criticisms are that, you know, Gmail and Google Docs still, they still do the encryption there, so they hold all the data on that end. But I just thought it was interesting to see this sort of bring your own encryption concept and, you know, to think about how that could apply in other areas, you know, with uh, clouds being public clouds in particular being real popular, the, the threat of lack of security is really out there. And to, you know, I think bring your own encryption is kind of a, a little bit out of the box way of, of looking at it. You know, I was wondering if, if maybe at the web service level, if you could do the same kind of thing. Could you do bring your own encryption on Gmail? Could you do bring your own encryption on document store on well, like a Dropbox? Hmm. You know, it, it puts the onus on the user a little bit more than the infrastructure. So, I what do you guys? With email, you have a chance there with maybe PGP, PGP. to encrypt the email, and then you you know you send out the email encrypted so that the contents of the email that are stored on Google server are already encrypted. All they ever see is that encrypted communication. And then I think with some of the file storage uh, things is that there's companies like Voltage, for example, right. that allow you to actually encrypt the file and then upload it, and then the other person has to have to do the decryption key. So, so if you, yeah. you would hold the private key and then you would publish the public key? The public key yeah. would be one way to do it. Or with some of these like documents, it's almost like you, you know, I think some people actually do this, is like they zip protect the file. So they uh, put a, a file inside of a zip file and then they put a password on it. So it's not really strong encryption, right. but I think have, some people have figured out a way to kind of like protect the data that way, although that's not cryptographically secure. Right. Hmm. I suspect this is going to have some sort of impact on, on at least law enforcement. This, there's the right, ongoing debate. There is which sort it, of yeah. a responsibility for investigation, but... Like, like I said, it sort of shifts the onus that law enforcement will either have to come get the key from the application owner rather than the cloud owner, or they'd have to find a way to get in the middle without the key, which... Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how, how different it is if, for if you were just to go out and find a VPS somewhere and start using your own keys, how different it is from what they're proposing here. Maybe I just haven't quite got the, the gist of it, but no, that is interesting. Yeah, and then another issue with it that came up when I was discussing with some of the guys here is that it probably puts a little more risk of insider threat Okay. because if if I'm publishing my application and my company owns the key now if somebody on in my you know inside my organization tries some sort of ransom scheme it's not held by the cloud provider right so that's another sort of byproduct I guess mm. I have to think more about that all right thanks Joe cool all right, next story is mine. This one comes from uh, Krebs on Security and is actually partway by uh, virtue of research done by RSA, which they've just released at Black Hat. Apparently, there is a VPN service uh, in China. Apparently, it's not a, exactly a legitimate VPN service. It's comprised of about 1,500 endpoints, most of which are hacked computers. So uh, there's a very interesting white paper on this. They're calling it the Terracotta VPN service, and it looks like they're scanning on port 135 to find vulnerable machines, popping them, installing certain things, you know, disabling antivirus and other security protections, and then setting up uh, a VPN endpoint and then reselling it. And it's interesting, all these various endpoints are all connecting to the same 
uh, radius server for authentication so it behaves as if it's a regular you know VPN service you go to your VPN server you log in and then it checks to see if you've paid for the service with this you know what other company it is and apparently there's several companies that are representing and serving as the front end for this one massive VPN network so this is kind of it's kind of neat in a, in one of those sort of neat but hmm, not so great ways right turns out that there's evidence that at least one APT group, Shell Crew, otherwise known as Deep Panda, has been using this service. And like I said, it's being sold as a legitimate VPN service to people. So some people are using it to bypass the Great Firewall or other sorts of censorship protections. Most of the users are within China, um, and they may not even be aware of how the VPN network was built. They may just be using it as, you know, okay, I've got a place I can log into, and I've been told it's going to be secure. You know, what could, what could possibly go wrong? So I think this is a pretty interesting story of someone trying to build basically a criminal enterprise off of the back of a whole bunch of hacked devices and computers. Some of the victim uh, verticals are listed, but not the actual victims. So you can get an idea of what kinds of companies are involved, as, it's including Fortune 500 companies. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it, it, it could be that any, anyone could have one of these servers. Luckily, there's indicators in the article, so if you want yeah. to try and look for these callouts that the, the, the VPN server is making, you should be able to identify them fairly quickly. You talk about the distribution of where these nodes are. Are they all over the place, or maybe just in China? Or? I, I'm not sure. I don't think I saw those in the article, but um, they did have stats that were pretty detailed on the distribution of where the users are coming from. Yeah. So that's an interesting read as well. Okay, great. Moving on, we have a, a segment with you, Stan. We're calling it By the Numbers. So let's, uh, let's hear some numbers. <laughs> uh, yes, this is a new segment we're trying. So some interesting statistics. Um, did you guys know that if you leave your machine unprotected, it could take just a few minutes or seconds for it to get scanned uh, by anybody, really? And if you have one of these popular services like SSH, uh, Port 80, a web, or Telnet, and this is actually something we always report in the weather report, right? Mm -hmm. So if you combine that with some sort of a weak password for authentication, you can actually get inside of that machine, depending on uh, where in the list that is, in just under an hour, actually. Hmm. So just some interesting statistics that we gathered up. You know, If you leave your machine out there with a weak password and a default port 22, and then, of course, no other protections like uh, user account lockout. So you're saying and just under an hour. No firewall, no. No firewall, scan. just wide open, and no, you know, very weak password. It could be compromised within an hour. Wow. We've seen instances of that. The Internet Storm Center used to have a, a statistic that we kept on how long it would take a, a machine once it was placed on the internet before it got scanned and. We've seen any number of cases recently where folks with weak passwords left on SSH servers were popped in, you know, in one instance, I think it took them 93 seconds. Leaving default passwords, leaving easy passwords is a bad thing. And there are, you know, we've, we've talked in the past a couple of ways you can protect yourself. For example, SSH, one of the things that some people suggest is moving it off of port 22. And that works to a point, but, you know, the bad guys are scanning not just for port 22, but for other ports, knowing that people move SSH off. In fact, uh, Johannes Ulrich just posted something over at the Internet Storm Center today on, you know, putting your SSH server on port 8080 isn't necessarily going to hide it. He's now seen evidence um, in some of our logs of, of folks scanning for SSH on port 8080. Hmm. Although I, I think one of the reasons the SSH sometimes shows up on ports like 8080 has to do with like hotel Wi-Fi networks that block SSH um, and but don't block the normal web ports so they move it to a port that they can reach from a hotel. Uh. Hmm. So the, that's that's interesting. So it's more for traveling people who are, they they would expect to be able to hit certain ports from wherever they happen to be, and that's why they chose that alternative port. That's interesting. Yeah, that's that's one of the one of the reasons that I've seen for using something like 8080 in particular, you know, or 443, that they've been on hotel networks that block port 22, and so move to a port that doesn't get blocked on that hotel network. 
but you know, the, one of the other things, uh, you know, Stan said you can, you know, get scanned and start getting scanned in as little as two minutes. And we've seen cases where once the password guessing happens, you can get, you know, you can get popped in, you know, less than two minutes. One of the things that I always suggest for folks putting a, a new server on the internet and running SSH or Telnet or um, any of these uh, that use that use a password is you run something like fail to ban. Mm -hmm. You you've got to be able to when folks are get, doing this guessing to block the block the bad guys even for a short period of time to slow them down. But that doesn't necessarily always solve the problem. Uh, we've seen. Uh, a number of these where there are lots of systems uh, doing coordinated scanning all from the same, appear to be all from the same slash 24 or even slash 16 network block where you'll get scanned by a.b.c.1, a.b.c.2, a.b.c.3. In those cases, maybe you just want to block the entire you know, block of... We, we've seen a lot of those, especially scanning on port 22 lately. So my, my personal preference, if you want to protect SSH in particular, since we've kind of zoomed in on SSH, is turn off password authentication completely. Yep. Only use public key authentication. Then they can bang at it all they want. They're not going to get in. Would you recommend uh, use of two-factor two auth as well or as an, op an alternative? Two-factor authentication is a little harder to set up. Um, but that that also is works just fine if you can do that. Because one of the issues with with doing it with only public key um, is if you don't have your keys with you and you're on you know you're on a on a different box and you need to in an emergency log back in, you can't. But you know, I've I've set up SSH on my home system to only allow public key authentication, and then I run Kippo on port 22, and I put the the actual SSH on a different port. I just let them bang away, and I collect collect the passwords they're guessing. All right, thanks, Jim. Actually, you're up next. There was an interesting article over on Graham Cooley's blog that you wanted to uh, talk about, having to do with password guessing. So take it away. An article that I just happened across, um, and the, the title was Why the Password Hackers Never Trigger an Account Lockout. And this is also kind of related to the, the previous issue. But, you know, the some folks, you know, are aware that if they guess, you know, if they mistype their password too often at various websites, they get locked out. And so the question is, you know, how can the, the hackers guess my password and get in. And the, the key is, yeah, they're, they're probably not actually trying to guess your password on the website by the brute forcing the kind of thing we see with SSH. Mm -hmm. They're much more likely to have stolen the, the password hashes someplace, and they're doing their cracking offline. And it's only once they actually get it that they'll, they'll try it on a website the lockout isn't going to affect them. And that's that's the big reason why when you hear about password hashes being stolen, even if they even if the passwords themselves haven't necessarily, you know, been revealed immediately, when the password hashes are stolen, you need to go change your password because the bad guys will then take them offline, use their systems with um, multiple GPUs to to do the cracking. So hopefully the the passwords are stored in a secure manner that they're they're hashed and salted. Um, but even even all of that really just is slowing down the bad guys. If they get their hands on the hashes, you know, they've got all kinds of CPU power or GPU power more likely that they'll do the cracking offline. So just because you've got an account lockout after three bad guesses, that's not how the bad guys are 
are trying to get into your accounts on, on websites yep. generally. That's a good insight to have. I mean, I, I know plenty of people who have, you know, are afraid that people are going to try and guess their passwords you know, to their Facebook account or to their online mail. And in most of those cases, the sites have a, a lockout mechanism that prevents that sort of thing from happening. I think it's a better way to sort of scare people into still making, you know, good decisions with their passwords is, is the key presence of a possibility of a keylogger. You know, a keylogger can still get your login password. So if you, that's true. You know, that's, use an intelligent password, it's less likely for something to be detected in a stream of keys. That could be. Although most of the keyloggers that I've come into contact with will actually log not only the keys that are being typed, but also the title of the page that you're you're currently looking at. So if you're going to a, you know a login site and you're typing these these characters in, they can reasonably assume that this is your username, this is right. your password. That's one of the reasons why, whenever possible, you know, enable two-factor authentication in places that have it. Two-factor authentication is, with things like Google Authenticator, is relatively easy to set up. Yep. Yeah, I wish more sites would offer it as an option, because then, even if they happen to log, you know, the the password portion of it, they don't have the token uh, on hand, so they won't. They still wouldn't be able to get in even with keyloggers. Yep. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Jim. We'll head over to the internet weather right now, starting with the top ten most probed ports. Uh, we've got TCP 23 at the very top. That's Telnet, followed by 22 SSH. Those have been towards the top of our list for a long time. Looks like 23 is actually bumped back up to the top from last week. We got a little bit of ICMP in there, which is typically the result of some sort of backscatter or responses on the network, not always an attack. Possibility that it's being used for DDoS, but more than likely backscatter. 445 is part of the Windows sharing numbered ports. It was also used famously by, I believe, Conficker. 53 UDP is DNS, often used in reflective DDoS, but also there is that recent DNS bug that we Involved. talked about. So it's possible that someone has started had a renewed interest in scanning for those. 1900 UDP is SSDP, 443 TCP is SSL. Skipping over ICMP, we have 80, which is standard web port, and then 1433, Microsoft SQL Server. We have a large segment today of, of other ports, 1,021 of those. So that's, it's not background noise, but it is interesting to see that that, that population continues to grow. Uh, next, we have the most sources probing, starting with, we actually have a large amount of ICMP, not sure what's causing that. It did bump up one spot from last week, but it could be backscatter. It could be just simply network issues. Who knows? 23 TCP we've covered. 27015 is related to Steam games. I believe that there's actually a possibility of using that in reflective DDoS as well, which is kind of interesting. 445 we talked about. 22 17788. I know John has looked at that a lot. The PP Stream peer-to-peer -peer video service which appears to be a mostly Chinese video sharing service. Doesn't seem to be malicious, but it usually shows up in our reports as scanning through the number of ports and another other servers that it connects to. 2816. That's time exceeded in transit. Uh, that's right. That's an ICMP one. Thank you. And the most of what we've got left is ICMP and other. Not too many changes this week. We'll go a little bit more in depth on some of the blips we've seen recently. 9101 TCP is registered to Bacula Director, but is also an alternate port for BitTorrent. We have seen that. It's been a significant increase in the scan SIPs for that one over the past seven days. Pretty interesting to note. We've also had a, an increase in the number of scan flows on port 44818, which is Rockwell Automation Control Logics PLC. PLC would be familiar to people who are interested in SCADA networks and control systems. So someone out there is looking for these particular PLCs. The graph you see here is 30 days of traffic. You can see that there was a bit of a murmur towards the start of those 30 days, a drop off, and then a significant increase in the number of scan flows. The majority of scans is coming from a single slash 16 in China. So someone there is very interested in, in Control Logics PLCs. They sound interesting to me. Uh, yeah. I may have to go and take a look into those and see if there's any known vulnerabilities. I think there might have been a, a denial of service against those devices, but as far as I know, that's it. Yeah. But any increase in scanning like this may suggest that someone else has found a vulnerability. May, may not. Maybe someone just found, you know, is a little bit late to the ball game. Scan flows on port 58455, which is the is typical of the Linux Darlaws worm which is one of those Internet of Things routers that we've been hearing so much about, as Brian would call it, the Internet of Insecure Things. I know he loves that phrase. 
You can see this is a 30-day graph. There's been a significant spike in the last day or so, but we've also seen some interesting hits in the past 30 days. Typically spikes, there doesn't seem to be much of a noise floor for the scanning on this one. Most of the scans are from several IP blocks within Korea, and I tend to think this is malware researchers, although I'm not really sure. The port itself is very specific to the Darlaws worm. I could find no other information as to other services that would use it. So if someone was hunting specifically for Darlaws infected devices, this would be the way to do it. Whether they're doing it in order to try and make a catalog of infected devices, or they're using it as a fingerprint to find devices that are potentially vulnerable, and knowing enough about Darlaws, you might also be able to exploit those devices. It's hard to say from this graph, but it is kind of interesting. It is interesting that the pattern here is not periodic like we normally see, or it's not even consistent, which makes me think potentially it is more related to research activity, like a researcher coming in and hitting the scan button. Mm -hmm. And trying to find out what they can find. So that's the show for today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of us, you can email us at attthreattrack at list.att.com. You can find AT&T Threat Track on the AT&T Check Channel, as well as on YouTube and on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at ATT Security. So thank you, Jim. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Stan. Again, I'm Matt Kaiser. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, keep your network safe.